My name is Halina Rubenstein Dunlop. I am Professor of Physics from University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And uh, my field of research is quantum physics and optics. Uh, I uh, run two research groups and in my time I have also done a lot of administrative work, um, leadership stuff. Uh, running a big school of mathematics and physics and um, I uh, um, d divide my time between active research and supervision of students and postdocs and um, lecturing uh, quite a number of undergraduate classes as well as more specialized classes in quantum physics and biophysics. Okay, so I, I have a mixture of research really. So originally I was atomic physicist. Mm -hmm. That's where I got my PhD in that sort of field. And then subsequently I um, started to do uh, optical micromanipulation, optical tweezers work, and uh, continued with quantum atom optics. So these two fields of research is what I do. Uh, they are related in my case, mm -hmm. uh, as in both of them I use structured light for the investigations that I want to do with my quantum atom optics systems as well as optical micromanipulation systems. So, um, it's quite an interesting question actually because after I finished my PhD in atomic physics, I thought that uh, it's time to be useful to the society. And so I uh, decided that I will, so there was one stage was finishing my PhD and then deciding what I want to do with the rest of my life or my future career. And I decided that I wanted to bring something back to the society mm -hmm. after my um, uh, graduation with my PhD. So I decided to do medical physics. Uh, but in order to do that, I had to do a few courses in anatomy and other things. And so um, I went and started to do that and it didn't quite grab me. So there was a little change in direction thinking, well, maybe I should go to industry and do industrial research and use the knowledge that I gained in physics from my PhD in industrial research. So I got a job with, um, as research scientist with um, Volvo, mm -hmm. a car company. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, me and a few others, we were building a lab, in, a laser lab for uh, detection of um, exhausts uh, in cars. So it was to totally new lab setting up, buying equipment, setting it up and trying to do spectroscopy on, on exhaust uh, fumes. Um, and that sort of lasted for almost a year. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I decided that it wasn't really research, it was sort of show showcase of, look, we got some researchers here who can do something for us. So again, it didn't totally agree with me. So there was another stage to decide, well, maybe maybe it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I had a boss who, um, uh, who um, was in a way a mentor and was trying to help me along the way with my career. And uh, we decided to apply for research money uh, to a Swedish Research Foundation together to start a new project that I would be leading from the university based on atomic spectroscopy that I knew very well but used for uh, trace element analysis. Mm -hmm. 
And we were successful with getting the grant, so I could happily, <laughs> next stage, I could happily come back to my university, which I did. And um, so the next stage was, um, so I started to run my own group, and I had PhD students and master students, and, and I was teaching uh, undergrad courses there. So there was sort of young researcher mm -hmm. trying to to find her way through the university. And then um, it was going very well. We got a lot of funding from uh, very prestigious agencies such as Wallenberg Foundation and and Swedish Research Foundation. So there was there was really lab was was really strong and good. And then uh, I happened to be married to uh, a guy who was also a scientist mm -hmm. um, from the other side of the world. Uh, and um, at that stage, he was a professor at our university of material science. And uh, he got an invitation of apply, to apply for a professorship in his part of the world. And he thought that was a very good idea to do. And I thought, ah. Let him apply. We see what happens with that. And uh, of course, he got the job. And uh, um, so we moved. Mm -hmm. So I packed up and went. The whole family went. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was next stage of my career to establish myself in Australia. So we uh, landed in Australia, and I thought it would be for a year. Uh, and then he would know better, and we would go back to Sweden. But it didn't eventuate. Meanwhile, while in Sweden, I started to build. While in Australia, I started to build my new group. Mm -hmm. And while um, on the plane between Sweden and Australia, I had this popular science magazine with me, and uh, it was an article of one of my teachers at the university in Sweden who wrote about optical tweezers and Arthur Ashkin. And so I was reading about it, and it was totally fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I'll be talking about it tonight. Anyway, uh, I was reading about it, and I thought it was, it was fantastic physics in it. Mm -hmm. And it was so simple mm -hmm. and so elegant. So when I landed in Australia, and I could choose what... I mean, I really didn't have any job I was going to, so I was sort of freelancing a bit um, um, as a research fellow. And uh, so I decided, well, let's set it up. Let's see what we can do. And so that was the start of my optical micromanipulation activity, mm -hmm. which was probably today, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, but it was fascinating because it was sort of very interesting in, in my career because when I was in Sweden, I was running like a, Chuk with the head cut off to progress my career stages and to get more and more funding from outside and grow the group and publish papers. And, and there was no way I, w I had time to look to the sides mm. in any new areas of research, but I, had, I felt that I had to run as fast as I could in one direction. But when I was thrown into another world where there were no expectations, no group, everything from the start, I decided to have fun. Mm -hmm. So this optical micromanipulation and optical tweezers was, was what I found really fascinating. And on the side of it, I also developed my other stream of things, which was atomic physics. And so um, there was another stage. In, and um, subsequently, the two groups grew, and again, I got a lot of funding from funding agencies in Australia, and I built my group. And so, what was the next stage? And the next stage um, probably was when I got a proper job mm -hmm. at the university. Um, and what was the next stage? And I continue this as normal. Uh, and the next stage was um, I was um, um, awarded, a, I got the professorship. And uh, that was quite a moment in my life because I didn't realize that I was the first female 
professor of physics in Australia. Wow. Ever. Mm. <laughs> And uh, so there were a lot of my f physics friends who heard that I got professorship who called me to congratulate me and told me that, you know, you are first woman professor of physics in Australia. And it wasn't that long ago, so it took them a long time to appoint first woman physicist. So I was very proud of it, but I wasn't even Australian then, so it was quite a funny situation. So there was another stage. And then what was another stage? After that, I was doing a lot of, as I said, I was running School of Mathematics and Physics. So in American system, it would be like being a dean of the school. Mm. So responsible for a lot of scientists and teachers and students and postdocs and representing them and whatnot. And then subsequently running my research groups. And then after many, many years of that, I returned to pure research and teaching. And that's really good. So that's my stage of the career now that I'm back to teaching and research. Well, you know, this is a question that we always ask our uh, people that we interview for positions. Um, which, which is your best publication and what are you most proud of? So I have to say that there are a couple. So, um, so when, I, uh, when I started to do optical tweezers, of course, it, it wasn't in the very beginning of optical tweezers. It was going on for a couple of years, so I had to find a niche of something that nobody has done before. So actually, I think that I'm most proud of my results in optical tweezers which had to do with transfer of angular momentum of light. So in normal optical tweezers what you do is you transfer momentum of light to the particles or to entities that you are playing with and then you can manipulate them in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And if you then instead not only do that but also transfer angular momentum of light, then you make things rotate mm -hmm. and you, try, you, you impart torques on the, on the entities that you are looking at. And I think that it would be for, fair to say uh, that we were the first group to have oh. done that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that paper, which dates from 1995, <laughs> so we're talking a long time ago, mm -hmm. is probably the one that I'm most proud of. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is another paper uh, that we did. So I, as I told you, I was running two parallel research groups. So I was still doing quantum atom optics. And we, in collaboration with Bill Phillips' group, which is Nobel Prize winner in, in physics, we uh, uh, did work on quantum tunneling in atomic systems, mm -hmm. which was the first also in the world. So this is another bit of my work that I'm very proud of. It took me most of my life to realize that the biggest impact on me, my mother had, really. I think she was a, a role model and a um, role model who taught me or instilled in me the, the, the hunger for science and understanding science and hunger for doing things that you love doing. I think that she was that person who did it from the side without me realizing it for a very long time, but eventually it came to me that it was her. So she had humongous influence on me. Um, and other people, I had very good mentor when I was uh, doing my PhD. My professor, who was my one of my supervisors for my PhD, was very good mm -hmm. in trying to instill in me values of myself mm -hmm. in science and uh, making sure that I would believe in myself and run mm -hmm. with what I wanted to do. Um, and that would be probably the two most important people. Mm. 
Well, I would lie if I would say that there were no difficult moments in my scientific career. Um, so the first one was actually during my PhD when my primary supervisor, uh, who was a man of course, uh, didn't believe that I was worthy of PhD. So that was, that was a very difficult uh, stage in my career to, to sort of um, not stop, not to stop believing in myself and finish my PhD without him necessarily believing in it. Um, and how did I manage it? I, I, I actually did have big, big help from, from my partner from my, and then my husband who um, could see through it much clearer through the problems than I could at, the t at that time and uh, was guiding me through it, giving me sort of type of self-belief that I needed for the moment, for that particular moment to deal with the problems that were around me. And of course then I graduated and I got my PhD and everything was okay, so that was, that was good. Okay. And the other difficult times, um, I find it very difficult when my students have difficulties. Mm -hmm. if, if any of my PhD students are struggling, I find it very difficult. And if you ask how I deal with it, I, I, I think that um, I get pretty involved in trying to find how on earth can I help them to get out of this impasse situation where, where they are trying to find what they want to do. So, um, yeah, so I think that um, it's atomo of uttermost importance to when you talk and um, collaborate with young people to make sure that they understand their own value. Mm. How clever they are, how uh, interested they are in the, in, the, in the stuff that they're doing, um, and also to have patience with, with um, uh, trying to reach the height that they want to reach, and so go slowly and, you know, systematically through the stuff, and um, maintain that curiosity all the time, and maintain the, the love of science and love of trying to understand new things or trying to come up with new th things. Mm -hmm. So patience, curiosity, love for science, um, I think that by the way mm. I run my groups, they mm. can see a lot of collaborations which I love having. Yeah. So they, they, they go for it as well. And uh, um, I've had, of recent, I've had two of my PhD students who stayed for a little while with me as, as postdocs. And I can see how this, and they happen to be two women, and I can see how these women are instilling in their doings the stuff that I was trying to show them how to do. A good scientist, in my view, is a person who is curious, who is um, questioning stuff that they're doing, uh, who, who has patience with um, um, results that they're getting, uh, who are inquisitive mm -hmm. and prepared for a little bit of failure on the way and then prepared to pick themselves up and run again and, and still love it all. <laughs>